Got it. So, hello everyone. My name is Steve McLeod. Thank you for joining this session of TCS's Coastal Connections Web Conference Series. I am the past president for the Coastal Society, speaking with you today from a very gray Buffalo, New York. But we are going to focus on a different color with our trending topic today, exploring blue carbon. Our guest presenters will discuss the potential for including restoration and enhancements of ecosystems like tidal marshes, seagrasses, and mangroves as part of the strategy to mitigate climate change based on the capacity of these systems to sequester and store carbon. Please note that this session is being recorded and the recording will be posted on the TCS YouTube channel in the coming days. For our non-member guests, the Coastal Society is a nonprofit organization founded in 1975 with the mission of fostering dialogue and advancing education to promote the wise use of our coastal resources. You can learn more about TCS and become a member at www.thecoastalsociety.org. We'll post that link in the chat. The Coastal Connection series is meant to better connect TCS members and guests from the coastal community throughout the year. Our intent is not just to learn from our knowledgeable guest panelists, but also to see and hear from you, our other participants. During the question and answer ses discussion period later in this session. We encourage you to turn on your camera and share your questions and thoughts at that time. Special thanks to Adrian Lauffer, Ashley Gordon, and Melanie Perello for their support in organizing and running this session. Ashley, are there any other logistical points that you would like to add at this time? Thanks, Steve. Um, yes, as Steve noted, we certainly encourage you to um, come on camera during the Q&A to participate in the conversation and ask your questions directly. You can use the raise hand function um, or type your questions in the chat. We just ask that you please hold questions until after our presentations. Um, and then we will also post a um, link to a post-event survey in the chat at the end of the hour and appreciate your feedback. So thank you all for joining today and back over to you, Steve. Great, thank you. Now I am happy to introduce our moderator for today's session, Adrian Lauffer. Adrian is currently the CEO and co-founder of Sea and Shore Solutions, LLC, providing consulting services in the field of coastal management and marine policy for federal, state, and non local and non-governmental organizations. Previously, she was a federal consistency portal coordinator and NOAA Coastal Management Fellow at the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development. Adrian earned a Master of Public Policy, Marine Policy and Management from Oregon State University. Finally, Adrian is a current board member for the Coastal Society, helping with programs like our Margaret A. Davidson Coastal Career Workshops. She's currently based in Corvallis, Oregon. Adrian, over to you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for that warm welcome. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Like Steve mentioned, my name is Adrienne Lawfer, and I'll be the moderator for today's workshop. I'm a coastal and ocean practitioner based out of Oregon, and I'm happy to be here today on behalf of the Pew Charitable Trusts and their blue carbon work. I've been lucky to engage in their expansive blue carbon efforts, which aim to increase information about blue carbon and forge blue carbon protections at the state level. Thank you to the Coastal Society for providing this platform for us to share some of our work and highlight two states that are trailblazers in this space. Um, we're going to start things off with Alex Moya from the Pew Charitable Trusts, who will be setting the stage for blue carbon and state level implementation. Alex Moya supports Pew's work to advance state and federal natural climate solutions, focusing primarily on state efforts to incorporate coastal blue carbon and peatland management strategies into climate mitigation efforts. Before joining Pew, Moya worked for the United States Environmental Protection Agency on non-point source pollution and Columbia River salmon issues in the Pacific Northwest. Earlier in her career, she focused on international environmental policy and served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Nepal. Moya holds a bachelor's degree in biology from Bucknell University and a master's, and master's degrees in public policy and in natural resources and environment from the University of Michigan. I will hand it over now to Alex. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, give me a second while I share my screen. Okay, can you guys see that? Looks great, Alex. Okay, 
All right. Uh, thank you, Adrian, and thank you, everyone, for having me here today. Uh, I'm going to kick things off by talking about how um, states are incorporating their coastal wetlands uh, into their climate planning. So. Um, blue carbon, uh, many of you are probably familiar with this term, but for those who are not, just wanted to give a quick overview. Um, so blue carbon is the carbon stored and sequestered in coastal habitats like seagrasses, salt marshes, mangroves, and forested tidal wetlands. Um, you'll often hear these habitats referred to collectively as blue carbon habitats. Um, blue carbon habitats can capture carbon at 10 to 20 times the rate of temperate forests, uh, making them an effective nature-based tool for mitigating climate change. Um, however, um, if these wetlands are destroyed or become degraded as a result of coastal development or other climatic stressors like uh, sea level rise, um, they can actually emit their carbon stores back into the atmosphere, uh, making their protection um, and their continued protection uh, all that much more important. Um, additionally, uh, coastal habitats also provide a myriad of ecosystem and economic co-benefits for uh, people and nature alike. So why should coastal habitats be incorporated into climate policy venues? And that's really the crux of the presentation that I'm going to be you know, discussing today. Um, so there's really two big takeaways here. Um, climate policy venues, um, or just climate policy in general, um, are often high policy priorities in states, um, especially for those that have ambitious greenhouse gas reduction goals. Um, climate policy can also unlock a significant um, amount of public funding. Um, we're seeing this with IRA and IIJA. Um, you know, this funding can trickle down to agencies like NOAA and EPA. Um, many of you might be aware that states are currently in the process of submitting EPA climate pollution reduction grants um, and policies to enhance carbon stocks in coastal estuaries, such as wetlands and mangroves, um, are specifically called out within the NOFO um, for, this, uh, for this funding. Um, climate policy plans are often tracked and updated. Um, this helps with accountabil accountability and durability. Um, and then at least in Pew's experience, um, there's often very few NGOs engaging at the necessary science and technical level to help incorporate coastal habitats into climate policy venues. Um, so it's really an area where states need assistance. So states, um, like I mentioned, if they have greenhouse gas reduction goals are often developing comprehensive climate plans in order to meet these goals. Um, and climate plans for states often develop an inventory of their sources and sinks. So states are really trying to determine, you know, what sectors are emitting greenhouse gases um, and then what sectors are sequestering and storing greenhouse gases. Uh, and natural working lands, which I'm going to get more, um, more into detail with over the next couple slides, um, are the only sector in the U.S. that removes more carbon from the atmosphere than it emits, um, removing around 12% of gross U.S. emissions in 2019. Um, and because natural landscapes can serve as climate sinks um, as part of broader climate planning, um, states can develop what are called natural working lands plans. Um, and again, gonna go into more detail about this, but essentially these NWL plans, as they're known in shorthand, um, are developing actions to reduce carbon emissions and then further expand carbon sinks um, across different landscape types. So natural landscapes, as I mentioned, are an, really an important piece of the climate solution. Um, however, it is a relatively new policy arena. Uh, so in 2020, uh, the U.S. Climate Alliance, which is a coalition of governors that stepped up to fill the void under the Trump administration um, after he pulled the U.S. out of the Paris Accords, um, issued what they called a National Working Lands Challenge. Um, and this really challenged states to improve inventory methods to quantify carbon storage, um, identify best practices to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, and advance programs and policies to enhance carbon sequestration um, across uh, natural working lands. Um, given, you know, given that uh, more conservative states or red states aren't, uh, don't often have climate, you know, or greenhouse gas reduction goals, um, most of the states involved in this challenge or that are part of the U.S. Climate Alliance are really those blue and purple states that are really interested in meeting greenhouse gas reduction goals. Um, so I've listed some here. Um, you'll hear from Maryland and um, Oregon shortly. Um, given the number of co-benefits that nat natural landscapes offer, you know, besides climate storage um, or carbon storage, um, this arena, like the natural working lands arena as a whole, um, can be uh, somewhat less politically controversial than trying to reduce emissions outright. So as part of these natural working lands plans, um, many states are often or are trying to incorporate greenhouse gas inventories. Um, and so the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change um, sets guidance for greenhouse gas inventories, um, which is inclusive of the land sector. And then within the land sector, uh, wetlands are also included. Um, 
this gets technical pretty fast, but there are essentially three tiers that IPCC has for their methodologies. Um, tier one is the most basic entry point for states or countries um, looking to develop a greenhouse gas inventory for their coastal wetlands, um, especially if they don't have uh, state specific or regional data available. Um, tier one has uh, default uh, values that states can use in lieu of, of some of that data. Um, there's two different sorts of carbon assessments that uh, you might have heard of. Um, there's really uh, carbon stocks, um, and then there's also carbon inventories. Um, and so estimates of carbon stocks tells us how much carbon is stored in the landscape at a particular time. Um, so it's really a snapshot, uh, whereas greenhouse gas inventories are more sophisticated. Um, and so they track over time the emissions and removals in a landscape um, and can help inform management strategies to further conserve and restore these habitats. Um, and these inventories can really act as a climate change balance sheet um, and are updated on a regular schedule to um, monitor changes. And this differs state to state. I'm sure Liz and um, Dylan and Elliot can talk about this later, but um, states often update these inventories every two to three years on average. It is important to note um, states do not have to have greenhouse gas inventories to set goals and targets for the conservation and restoration of their coastal habitats or other natural working lands. Um, but we always like to say it's hard to manage what you haven't measured. Um, and so, uh, like I said, inventories can help uh, states track their progress in achieving their climate goals. Um, because inventories are such uh, an important piece, you know, sort of within this broader policy space, um, Pew has spent a lot of time and effort uh, on improving the science around quantifying the carbon um, in these ecosystems. So I've talked about natural working lands plans and I've talked about inventories. And so really how does blue carbon fit into this? Um, many groups working within the natural working land space are really focused heavily on agriculture and forests um, for good reason. You know, the footprint of these habitats are massive. But as we know, coastal wetlands are carbon powerhouses, right? They store on you know, a per acre basis more carbon than an old growth forest does. However, as we started engaging in this space, um, we found that many states didn't think methodologies um, existed for you know, incorporating these habitats into greenhouse gas inventories, um, or a lot of states thought that the science didn't really um, exist to incorporate these habitats you know, into these sorts of natural working land strategies or climate planning. Um, the federal agencies have a lot of data for quantifying the amount of carbon stored in forest ecosystems and other you know, landscape types. Um, but this doesn't really exist for coastal habitats. There's pretty limited data available at the federal level, um, which really puts the onus on states to incorporate these habitats into these plans. Um, and so as a result, um, if states don't really have the necessary um, state data sets or regional data sets that they can draw on, they've omitted coastal wetlands um, out of these plans as a result. Um, and so, you know, we've really tried to bridge this gap. Um, we've been working over the last couple of years. We've been engaged in Oregon and California, North Carolina and New Jersey um, to help these states develop measurable targets for conservation and restoration of their coastal habitats and show them that, you know, IPCC methodologies exist and help, um, you know, connect some of the science that is available to policymakers to show that these habitats can be incorporated into these um, climate policy venues. So here's an example from California um, of the sorts of management actions or targets that states can include in their state, you know, natural working land strategies. Um, so California included targets which cover a portion of their state's um, blue carbon habitats, um, and they really focused on the tidally influenced wetlands in the Sacramento and San Joaquin Delta. Um, right now, these wetlands are altered or in some sort of degraded form, um, and so they're actually emitting greenhouse gases right now. Um, so efforts to restore these will result in both greenhouse gas um, emissions reductions um, and then also help restart longer term uh, carbon burial. And again, you'll hear from Maryland and then Oregon later about um, how their states have specifically incorporated their habitats or their coastal wetlands um, into these natural working lands plans. So how does Pew you know, work with the states? Um, often the folks involved in developing greenhouse gas inventories um, for states are in an air resources department. Um, and so frequently, you know, they're, they're not really wetlands folks, right? They're not versed in wetland science. Um, and then the wetlands folks or researchers on the ground collecting carbon data um, aren't necessarily connected to, um, to folks in the air resources department. So Pew is really at work to act as a convener by bringing together the scientists and then the policymakers. 
Um, we also help bring in technical expertise to states, um, you know, folks that are, you know, can help crunch the numbers for blue carbon inventories as, as it gets technical um, really fast. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we help provide support for science products and really building the scientific case for why these habitats um, should be included in these National Working Lands plans um, and inventories. Um, and then importantly, because this space is so nascent um, and, you know, just relatively new, um, we launched the Blue Carbon Network last year, yeah, early 2022, um, to help states share best practices and work through challenges. Um, and so we do this through quarterly webinars, highlighting state actions such as what Maryland's going to talk about in Oregon. Um, we also develop resource materials like case studies, um, and we host in-person convenings so that states and other folks working within this space can really connect and talk through um, the challenges that they're facing um, and learn from one another. So lastly, even though, you know, the crux of this, this conversation um, or presentation has really been focused on state, uh, you know, state climate action and, and blue carbon, um, I do want to touch on federal priorities briefly. Um, you know, right now we're really seeing that um, you know, at the U.S. or in the U.S., um, blue carbon action is really being driven at the state level. Um, blue carbon at the federal level has gotten a lot of attention this year um, due to the release of the administration's Ocean Climate Action Plan, um, money coming down from BIL and IRA, um, and then the release of the administration's Nature-Based Solutions Roadmap. Um, so, you know, it is it is gaining more attention. Um, the administration has made this a priority. Um, so I just sort of want to cap off by noting that, you know, States are eager to incorporate coastal wetlands in their climate plans. We've seen that, you'll, you'll hear from Maryland and Oregon, um, and they've made great progress in doing so, but need continued leadership from the federal agencies who can help connect states to data and money and resources. So essentially, you know, federal agency coordination and leadership can help support a further state blue carbon action um, within these broader policy venues. That is it from me. Um, any, you know, happy to answer any questions uh, at the end. Um, I have my email here if you have you know, any follow-up you'd like to do afterwards. Um, and then I've also included a link to the Blue Carbon Network if you're interested in joining. Um, it's open to all, anyone who's interested in you know, learning more about uh, state action on blue carbon um, within you know, climate planning. So uh, yeah, happy to answer any questions and thank you for having me. Sorry. Thank you, Alex. To figure out how to not share my screen anymore. Okay. No worries. Thank you, Alice, for providing that helpful background and context about blue carbon. Now we will move into more focused presentations explaining how states have gotten involved with blue carbon through state climate planning. First, we have the state of Maryland joining us to discuss how they're using their new greenhouse gas inventory to further the state's conservation and restoration goals. Dr. Elliot Campbell directs the Office of Science and Stewardship within the Chesapeake and Coastal service at the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. His expertise is in systems ecology and the interactions between people and the natural environment. His work focuses on climate mitigation, quantification, and planning, along with ecosystem service, quantification, and tools to aid in integrating this information into decision-making. We're also joined by Dylan Tiley. Dylan is a coastal analyst with Maryland Department of Natural Resources, assisting and leading in the visualization, communication, and interpretation of coastal resilience related data sets within the coastal zone. Hand it off to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Ellie, I'm going to pull up the slides real quick. Uh, can you all see my screen okay? Yes. Yep, that looks great. <clears throat> okay, awesome. You can go ahead and kick us off, Elliot. Thanks, Dylan. Yeah, we're gonna be tag teaming this. I'm gonna give a, a quick um, overview of a few initiatives we have going in Maryland, and then Dylan is gonna go a little more in depth into a exciting blue carbon feasibility study that we have going on. Um, <clears throat> can you click? Yeah, so we're not, we're not paving a way forward. We're going to plant a way forward with blue carbon in Maryland. Paving just makes the problem worse, right? All right, <laughs> can we uh, go to the next slide? <clears throat> so we have a number of initiatives related to blue carbon going on in Maryland. Um, they really came into focus in 2021 when the Commission on Climate Change issued a formal recommendation on blue carbon and to incorporate blue carbon into our inventory. 
um, which we did in the 2020 inventory that was released about a year ago. Um, Blue Carbon was also a focus of our Conservation Finance Act. We had a webinar series. Um, we participated in a study with Duke University uh, and participate with the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center and their Coastal Carbon Research Network that Pew also uh, has been facilitating. But <clears throat> for this talk, we're gonna focus on the Blue Carbon Inventory, uh, a, a collaborative study with George Mason University and the Nature Conservancy on the ecological effects of sea level rise and the impacts on blue carbon. And then that aforementioned Blue Carbon Feasibility Study, also collaboration with the Nature Conservancy. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> So we started with uh, the EPA's national blue carbon inventory, which exists for, for any coastal state, but then recognized that Maryland has some uh, per particular aspects that required us to do a little more work on, on that inventory, particularly that we have the Chesapeake Bay, one of the largest estuaries in North America, uh, and a full range of salinities from tidal fresh all the way to uh, polyhaline within the bay. So we calculated the amount of wetlands in each salinity regime um, in the bay. And that <clears throat> we found that through literature view to not necessarily, to not be influential in the amount of carbon sequestration going on in the wetlands, but it is influential in the amount of methane emissions, which is really key to calculating that net greenhouse gas uh, impact from wetlands. So you can you can just click through, yeah. So we had <clears throat> specific rates um, to our coastal wetlands, to the different salinity zones. We also integrated submerged aquatic vegetation, which we were the, the first state to, to do that. Um, <clears throat> And that resulted in a number that was similar to what the uh, Sylvestrum, which was doing a study for the EPA, um, had produced, but, but slightly higher. And a big caveat to this is that uh, for this study, we used the 100-year global warming potential for methane, um, which results in a number that's about 25 times that of the global warming potential of CO2. But for our official inventory, the they use the global warming, the 20-year global warming potential, which results in a number about 84 times for methane that of CO2. So that essentially negates all of the carbon benefit um, in the inventory. So if you look at the inventory, we present this number, but what actually gets factored in is, is, is much lower. Um, but that doesn't mean that wetlands are not important for carbon because they're also storing tremendous amounts of carbon, which um, thanks for doing that. We have a, a link to the inventory, which I assume will be uh, distributed along with these slides. All right. So again, getting to that carbon storage, we looked at, and I, I think I deleted the slide that had what project this is, but this is part of the the NOAA Ecological Effects of Sea Level Rise work with the Nature Conservancy and George Mason University. So modeled out what we think could happen with wetlands under, this is a, a high scenario of sea level rise. Um, and if we were to have that amount of sea level rise, we would lose uh, a tremendous amount of both wetlands, but other types of land use in the state. Um, and then the carbon that's stored both within the wetlands and then impacted lands like forests um, it would be about 10 and a half million megagrams, so that's equivalent to metric tons of stored carbon loss by 2100. But the amount of sea level rise is really influential there. If we had uh, a lower amount of sea level rise, that would cut that loss by about in half, but still quite impactful. All right, we can go to the, the last or last slide of my section. Um, <clears throat> so we want to take actions today that can prevent or at least uh, mitigate the partially mitigate the impacts that we project in the future. So, to do that, we have, are looking at ways to strategically conserve lands that we project to be wetlands in the future through our coastal resilience easement program, uh, and strategically restore lands that we think, if with a little bit of help, could uh, 
could maintain as well as into the future. So we're util utilizing results of that um, Wellens modeling I showed before, and then new data sets like the USGS uh, UVVR data. So with that, I'm gonna hand off to Dylan. Thanks, Elliot. Yeah, um, so it, you know, we have a lot going on in Maryland um, as far as um, the, the, the carbon and, and blue carbon front, front goes. So we had to kind of try to focus, uh, focus our presentation today, but um, you know, we're happy to share out uh, resources afterwards. But I'm going to focus on our partnership with TNC um, and, uh, and ESA, which is um, Environmental Science Associates, um, who are based out in California, but they're they're collaborating with us um, on on a blue carbon feasibility assessment, um, and uh, and I wanted to note that you know we we started that earlier this year, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. But um, but before we started the feasibility assessment, um, DNR and TNC did a lot of a lot of work um, collaborating with folks around Maryland to understand uh, the types of projects that they're working on and whether they might fit into to this feasibility study. And so there was kind of a buildup before we actually um, got ESA, um, you know, the, the contract and got started um, to, to sort of put in some work to understand, you know, to some Elliot's points, um, some places that, that are lower salinity that might not really fit into to a blue carbon related project because of the methane emissions. And, and we ended up including some of those in that are kind of on the line, but um, but there was some some work beforehand to kind of try to tease out um, what all is going on as 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 far as um, as far as mostly marsh restoration in, in Maryland. Um, so the the stage we're at right now, it, it, it's um, although we feel like you know we are um, uh, planting a new path, um, we're only in the feasibility assessment as far as a blue carbon development project, and there's a lot. Um, that happens after feasibility. Um, you know, the verification process um, that, that ESA is using um, in this feasibility assessment that we're, we're working on um, is fairly intensive. And so um, to actually get to a place where blue carbon credits will be sold on a market, um, we're, we're a, little, a little far away from, from that process if it's even feasible to, to, to sell them on, on a market. So, um, so we're here in the feasibility success set, section, but there, there's a lot, um, you know, to, to happen uh, to, to actually get one sold on the market afterwards. So Elliot um, alluded to the Conservation Finance Act, which was passed in, in 2022. Um, and uh, we started our feasibility study in, in February of, of this year. And um, we plan to have it finished up um, by November of this year. So you know, we're real close to um, having been able to present the results of that feasibility study in this in this webinar, and, and maybe um, you know somewhere down the line you can catch us um, giving a talk about about the results. Um, but but the Conservation Finance Act was was a pretty novel um, piece of legislation that that uh, allowed for some some novel finance um, uh, options as as far as um, funding restoration work. Um, and part of it requires a, a green carbon project and also a, a blue carbon project by 2024. And so this little end zone here would be a, a, a potential blue carbon project if it's, if it's feasible in the next year. I wanted to note, you know, to some of the points that, that folks have brought up today, you know, there have been successful um, mangroves related blue carbon projects sold on a market. Um, seagrass is is in the process of a verified project in, in Virginia um, and TNC is working closely on that project. But I, I put a check here because it's in, it's in the, the process of verification. So it's a little bit further along than ours is, but we have a, you know, kind of a big question mark here for, for marshes and, and coastal wetlands a little bit, at, at least, um, especially for, for us in Maryland with our varying salinity levels. Um, and that's part of what this feasibility study will, will, will hopefully tell us. Um, so the process for our study, and I don't really have time to get in super into detail. Um, I will talk about each of these briefly, but um, it, it'll be pretty fast. Um, but in, in our study, we have a technical feasibility portion. And I noted, you know, um, I'm focusing on our carbon resiliency related work uh, or our carbon crediting related work, but 
Um, there's also um, an aspect of resilience crediting within our feasibility study, which is a, a, a pretty new um, form of crediting. And, uh, and I'm not going to get into that, but, um, but, but TNC is working on the potential of, um, of resilience crediting um, as well. Um, and there'll be a financial feasibility portion. So um, looking at the future price of carbon um, using the TNC financial analysis tool, um, it'll consider social considerations, organizational feasibility, and then a landscape feasibility to sort of see where other projects might be possible. Um, so I'm gonna go into each of these quickly. Um, and we at DNR will also be performing a legal feasibility portion as well that goes along with that Conservation Finance Act um, that, that was passed. So in the technical feasibility portion, um, you know, you, you have to determine each project within our study's boundaries, um, look at the, the sea level rise migration space um, so that you can sort of see where that habitat might shift to and, and what, what might be lost. And you can get an idea of, of the project's permanence. So sort of how long um, you can expect the, the carbon to be held in the ground and sequestered. Um, and um, so th that's kind of your, your basis for starting the technical portion of a feasibility assessment. Um, you'll also determine the carbon stocks. So both above ground carbon stocks and below ground carbon stocks. And then you're gonna, you're gonna determine the baseline scenario versus a project scenario. And so this is from a feasibility assessment that, that ESA actually recently completed in Texas. Um, I don't think it's quite released yet, so we can't share the link, but, um, but just looking at um, some of this pink section and this light green section, the light green section being low salt marsh and the pink being salt, salty prairie, that's what it looks like right now. And then, it, you know, this is a pretty common image in 2100. The, the, the low salt marsh um, turns into open water and, and some of that salty prairie turns into high and low salt marsh. And so um, this baseline scenario up here um, will be compared to um, the project scenario with and without a project. And so um, if you were to do some sort of thin layer placement or, um, or uh, an enhancement here, um, what would this, uh, this project parcel look like um, and how much carbon would still be on the ground versus um, business as usual. Um, and so there's also a financial feasibility portion and, and TNC is working on this for ours. Um, and it's a, it's a fairly complicated process to, to sort of understand the cost and benefit of each potential project. Um, and I should note that for some of the marsh projects, because you're talking about moving large amounts of dirt and, um, and, and high project costs um, to, to enhance marshes. Um, this is, a, you know, there, there's a lot of question marks with this as far as the, the financial feasibility and whether the, the, the price of carbon on the market can, um, can, you know, pay for some of those high project costs. Um, but TNC is, you know, um, using one of their financial analysis tools um, and they're including estimates on engineering costs um, and they're also going to be doing a, a sensitivity analysis. So um, sort of looking at the comparison between a, a similar project in a high salinity versus a low salinity environment um, and, and sort of how those methane emissions um, from the lower salinity um, might affect the financial feasibility of, of a project. Um, and also looking at the, the, how the future carbon price will impact the, the revenue stream from a potential uh, crediting uh, crediting project to be sold on the market. Um, th there has to be an organizational feasibility portion. So who owns the site? Who's going to pay for the project? Who's going to monitor and manage the site? And, and how will these organizations all work together? So, you know, just um, organizing how that the actual um, verification of, of the credits and how much carbon is being sequestered, um, how that will work and, and the ownership. Um, and this is a picture, you can see Elliot here in the middle. I'm taking the picture, but this is a picture of us um, touring one of our sites earlier on kind of a windy day um, down in Deal Island in Maryland. Um, there's a social considerations portion. So um, they also will be taking into account sort of the, the impact on flood resilience by these some of these um, projects, um, job creation, the uh, effects on vulnerable 
populations. So you can see like the social vulnerability index um, here um, around Baltimore City um, and just other uh, community benefits and challenges. And finally, they'll be doing a landscape feasibility. And so, you know, not every um, project that might come, come to fruition um, is something that we were able to identify. And so ESA will be doing a GIS analysis to identify additional sites that might, might pro provide similar benefits as far as carbon sequestration and maybe might be a little more financially feasible. Um, and, and they'll be looking at grouping projects sort of to, to provide the more bang for the buck. So, you know, when you're looking at moving a bunch of sediment, you know, can you identify a few projects um, in the same general vicinity that, that, um, that can be grouped together to, to provide a little bit more financial feasibility. Um, so there's five projects in Maryland that were selected. Um, there's a marsh restoration um, by dredging uh, that was already happening by the Army Corps, um, a marsh restoration by upland sediment, um, uh, migration corridors slash protection projects. So not any actual restoration, just the protecting of lands um, for, for marsh migration. Um, and, then, and then the resiliency project is around Baltimore City. And so I'm not gonna focus on that. Um, and finally, a, a resiliency and carbon crediting combination, which is um, a, a Martian island restoration down in Crisfield. And so just quickly, the project locations, the resiliency crediting up here in Baltimore that I mentioned, um, the protection spaces down in Blackwater, which Elliot focused on with some of those sea level rise projections um, and their effect on carbon. Um, and then the Crisfield project, um, and off to the right here is a coastal bays, um, the upland sediment project for marsh restoration. And finally, in the lower right here uh, in, in Somerset County is um, the, the Deal Island uh, dredging for marsh restoration project. So um, we really hope that this feasibility study um, can inform the required blue car carbon project from the Conservation Finance Act. Um, that's really, we had good timing as far as this project panning out and collaborating with TNC on it. Um, and, and we're really hoping we can use the results of the feasibility study to, to sort of understand where the best place to maybe put a project on the ground or, or the best conditions for, for facilitating a blue carbon project would be. Um, so thanks so much. Uh, I'll, I'll stop there and uh, Hope I didn't take up too much time, um, but uh, I'll, uh, yeah. Well, that was great. Thank you so much, Dylan and Elliot. Um, and I do have uh, a link as well to Maryland's recently released greenhouse gas inventory, which I'll make sure gets in the chat so that folks are able to take a peek at that if they want. All right, next we're gonna move along to the state of Oregon with Elizabeth Ruther, who is based in Portland, Oregon who works in Washington and Oregon to protect lands and waters, advance freshwater connectivity, and promote climate-ready state and local policy and management. Part of Liz's portfolio focuses on conservation of coastal and nearshore habitats on the West Coast, including advancing policy and management efforts to help sustain coastal watersheds and the services they provide for people, coastal economies, and nature in a changing climate. She has worked in for-profit, nonprofit, and government sectors, including the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development and the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. I'll hand it off to you, Alex, or Elizabeth, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Adrian. Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay, double checking before I start talking. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so pleased to be here today. Um, I am going to kind of give a juxtaposition to the very technical um, 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 work that's occurring at the state level uh, that Marilyn just gave, which was excellent. I'm gonna kind of zoom out a little bit and talk about the governance and the policy actions that are set in place um, and um, uh, wow, all that technical work is happening. Um, so I'm gonna talk about Oregon's experience a little bit in integrating blue carbon into state climate actions. If I would click the right thing. 
Um, so Alex mentioned what an inventory is and that Oregon created one. Uh, and we just heard um, uh, Marilyn's information about what it takes to create an inventory. And it, it's just one very science-based step in a series of policy and management steps toward realizing the power of blue carbon habitats as part of um, state um, greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. So once you have a blue carbon inventory, then what? Um, what are the practices um, that sequester the most carbon? How does it fit into the greater natural working land sector that Alex talked about? Um, and so I'm going to focus um, the rest of this presentation on um, starting starting to discuss, not answer, starting to discuss um, um, those questions. So um, I think, yes, Alex popped this up on, on her slide in the beginning um, that um, um, the, the Oregon War, uh, Global Warming Commission, now called the Oregon Climate Action Commission, um, issued a um, natural working lands proposal in 2021. So um, that was birthed um, from an executive order issued by um, former Kate, um, former Governor Kate Brown, um, and among other actions requested that um, natural working lands um, be considered in the state's um, uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction strategies and to make recommendations, which the commission did. Uh, it provided only a short time, just over 12 months um, to do so. And within that time to demonstrate it was possible to include coastal wetlands in the state's first inventory, um, Pew partnered with the state agency, um, uh, the Department of Land Conservation and Development that houses the Oregon Coastal Management Program. Um, and we worked along with carbon experts and coastal wetland researchers to determine whether a blue carbon inventory was possible and what approach to take um, to build it. Uh, this technical blue carbon working group was hosted by the state and offered a white paper on blue carbon to the commission and, and ultimately the commission included it um, with um, goals for overall natural and working lands um, sequestration. Um, so of course that was occurring in a, in a broader policy kind of landscape and context and timeline. So I'm gonna zoom out for a second. Um, and talk about that. Um, I've broken it into three phases just for ease of conversation. Um, I think we'll call um, phase one initiation. Uh, Alex talked about the US Climate Alliance's challenge, um, the challenge for natural working lands. And that was around um, 2017 or when the Alliance formed. Um, uh, and that it was a group of governors that kind of backfilled the need. Um, so then Kate, um, uh, Governor Kate Brown, I keep wanting to call her Kate, uh, Governor Kate Brown um, issued the executive order in, in 2020. Um, and, then, um, and then the commission came out in August of 2021 with the proposal, uh, which also recommended state targets and included blue carbon habitats, yay. Um, so the next steps could really be considered um, a policy and governance establishment phase. So um, we've been busy over the past couple of years from 2022 to 2023. It, was, it took part um, of a natural working lands project uh, that the commission um, 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 partnered with um, the Institute for um, Natural Resources um, uh, in Oregon on at the Oregon State University. Um, from that took place from 2022 to 2023. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and at the same time, um, in the uh, 2023 legislative session, uh, natural climate solutions legislation was passed uh, that did a number of important things, um, which I'll also um, talk about in a minute. Um, oh, I should have mentioned that um, the last the last phase on the slide is called implementation, I think, in my brain. It's like, what is happening now um, after that policy and um, and this um, National Working Lands Project um, is in place, um, which will be very high level since this is a very short um, presentation. Oopsies, that's not what I wanted to do, but oh, great. So, um, we talked about national working lands and national working lands plans, and I thought it was just worth kind of looking at exactly what the goal of that challenge was. Um, and of course, the blue carbon habitats and, hab and work that we've been doing in Oregon um, is starting to fit into this greater 
um, natural and working lands um, effort that's occurring in Oregon. So um, it's it's important to talk about it and then I'll bring it back to blue carbon. So, you know, the Alliance members are scaling the best practices they can identify for land management, restoration and conservation to contribute to emission reductions. And um, where appropriate integrating natural and working lands into state mitigation resilience plans, which is, which is what Oregon um, is doing. Uh, the ambitious goals are being set um, and, um, and, and of course they're gonna prioritize actions that deliver multiple benefits, which I'll talk about. Um, a little bit as well. Oh my gosh, me and my really scrolly thing. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, I mentioned the commission adopted the proposal and that set the goals for carbon capture and storage on Oregon's natural working lands. And the Institute for Natural Resources at Oregon State University received funding from the US Climate Alliance and the Natural Resources Conservation Service to accomplish the, the, the listed items in a project as part of a great uh, a natural working lands project to provide further information to the commission about their proposal. The sectors that they uh, dealt with include agricultural landscapes, uh, blue carbon habitats, rangelands, grasslands, forest woodlands, and urban suburban environment. Um, so the project uh, established a team and then a technical team and a stakeholder advisory committee for each of those sectors. Um, Pew participated on the blue carbon um, in the blue carbon landscape. Importantly, they were trying to figure out how to develop a methodology for uh, for Oregon's natural working lands in those um, subsectors. Uh, and to identify which practices um, um, had enough science um, to um, to um, proceed with confidence that they would sequester carbon uh, and also um, start looking at um, the workforce and training needs that um, Oregon will need in order to implement as well as identify community impact metrics. Uh, they needed to produce a final report, which they just did, um, which is fantastic. Um, and um, it looks like that. <laughs> it is called uh, Foundational Elements to Advance the um, Oregon Global Warming Commission's Natural and Working Lands Proposal. And it was just issued yesterday, um, which is great because I was wondering if I was going to be able to um, provide the link to you or not. Um, and we can. So um, there, of course, were five sectors, but I'm going to focus on blue carbon. Uh, the practices that emerged for blue carbon um, are similar to practices elsewhere in the nation and globally that center on protection of the habitats you have so that you don't lose it, lose what you already have and what you're storing in the ground and in vegetation. Um, conserving blue carbon habitat through um, various land use management and regulatory actions, and um, also, of course, restoring um, those habitats. The, um, you'll see on this slide that some practices emerged as recommended and some um, uh, are called emerging. Um, recommended practices um, are kind of defined in the report as the practices most um, likely effective in reducing greenhouse gases. They have strong um, scientific evidence from peer reviewed publications and sufficient data um, to determine that they are definitely a sink. Um, and uh, and they um, the the technical committee was confident that um, management practices combined with this data will help the state achieve its goals. Emerging practices are, are um, practices um, that are not recommended at this time, um, but they should be kept an eye on, uh, despite the fact that they're, they hold promise to um, sequester carbon because of the need for more data um, uh, to determine a given practices effectiveness, to understand the carbon cycle better, to understand emissions, um, 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 uh, reduction and or if the, um, or or general emissions. So um, Maryland um, speakers mentioned um, the methane, the methane emissions that occur with salinity regimes, and um, of course Oregon is figuring out that same those same issues. So. Um, uh, tidal wetland conservation, tidal wetland restoration, and seagrass conservation are recommended. Those are broad. They have um, kind of sub sub practices under each of those um, under each of those categories. Um, I could probably spend the entire um, uh, presentation on this slide because there is a story to each one of the practices and why they were or were not recommended, but we'll continue for now. 
Um, so during the conversations of the uh, during the Natural Work Lands project and in the stakeholder advisory committee, there is a couple of important considerations I thought would be worth sharing with folks today. Um, when um, you're talking about um, um, greenhouse gas emission reductions, of course, um, the practices identified for blue carbon and, and all the practices for the natural working lands sector um, do un unlock um, or have the potential to unlock a multitude of interconnected benefits, right? And these um, co-benefits extend beyond carbon sequestration and um, they hit on various environmental, social, and economic um, gains. Uh, so and it's important to consider these co-benefits because we want to leverage uh, uh, what we're already doing in state, uh, can leverage federal programs, and you can create a holistic and robust approach to working towards natural working land goals. Uh, but while we we're having discussion, it really came up um, that um, how to evaluate, how to value, and how to account for co-benefits was really difficult, and it wasn't it wasn't taken up as as a as a a methodical part of, um, of the project, um, but there was an activity, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, that starts to get at it. So we talked a lot about trade-offs um, as well. And of course, trade-offs um, can consider positive and negative impacts, and they can vary for the same action when considered at different scales. So for example, if the dike is removed and coastal wetlands are restored for um, carbon benefit, there's also flood storage and potential storm protection. Um, however, the use of the previously diked area, right, is no longer feasible in the future. So there's always there's always trade offs. The same goes for a, a forest land potentially, right? If the wetland or riparian area area is restored, um, the landowner may experience decreased revenue, uh, but the entire state may experience a decreased wildfire cost. That's as a as an unfounded example, right? Um, so uh, it's complicated, um, and um, and it, there was um, conversation um, on the advisor committee about you know what is what does it take to make individuals and communities whole for societal level benefit benefits. Um, but you can imagine there is very little time for talking about that robustly. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, these trade offs are considered in collaborative planning processes, um, which are often. Uh, underfunded or when funded sometimes can be poorly executed because it's very tricky, very tricky conversations and skilled facilitation really needs to happen. So the report that was just published talks about the need to do more of this work. Um, and um, there are tools developed in other geographies like California, Sacramento, Delta region uh, that um, 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 exist and could be applied in Oregon to facilitate collaborative planning um, on these topics. Um, the Oregon's project also started the work of tracking community impacts by selecting a wide array of socioeconomic indi indicators to inform the positive and negative impacts of this work. I wanted to make sure um, I mentioned the legislation. So at the at the time of this um, large project that was um, undertaken by the um, commission uh, this spring, there is also um, natural climate solutions legislation um, uh, that was passed as part of the larger climate resilience package. It provided some statutory backbone and governance structure for the work that's occurring in Oregon. So it defined natural working lands in statute. For example, it established uh, natural working lands as a valid uh, emission reduction strategy. Uh, it required um, state agencies um, to work together to set uh, targets um, by 2025. It establishes a process to work with tribal nations to potentially incorporate indigenous practices and, um, and of course, requires agencies uh, to maintain um, their inventories once, once developed. And um, um, they, it also established a permanent fund for uh, natural climate solutions on private lands, which is really um, fabulous. Um, Oregon has a long history of landowners um, stewarding their land, and so that the state um, purposefully invested in those practices was, was um, Great news. Woo. So um, that kind of wraps up phase two, right? The governance and 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 the, the, the setting up uh, of the policy. Um, and um, Oregon is quickly running into kind of phase three implementation. Um, this image um, on the slide is from a recent article that discusses what it takes to establish carbon accounting and management at the state level. Um, I've circled the areas that Oregon has made the most progress in um, that I just described, right? They are closing in on their inventory planning. They have begun organizing how agencies will work together to maintain their inventories um, and, and how to document the work. Um, 
It's worth noting that the legislation that passed didn't detail um, the how very much. Um, and so, um, but it did establish the group of state agencies that will work together and in the near future with the help of the lead agency named in the legislation, the, the uh, Oregon Department of Energy, they'll need to tackle questions um, around quality um, um, control um, and assurance, how to archive the data, how to improve the inventory over time, like how to incorporate the emerg emerging practices that that I mentioned. Um, um, I highly um, um, recommend um, this article. Uh, if you want to read more about what the authors are calling a uh, greenhouse gas inventory management system, I thought it was a really helpful frame. So specifically for um, blue carbon, um, uh, there is, um, you know, there's been a good support infrastructure um, that uh, that has been created um, and and partly is ongoing um, uh, to ensure that the work um, continues. So um, the legislation. Uh, uh, established um, a formal National Working Lands Advisory Committee, or rather uh, an associated piece of legislation. And that um, that committee has a uh, blue carbon seat and will advise the commission on um, blue carbon issues in, into the future. Uh, I mentioned the interagency working group that uh, the legislation formed, and that's facilitated by the commission and, and the lead agency. And they're busy, they're busy auditing existing state agency programs. Uh, they need to create that natural working lands inventory for all of the subsectors I mentioned. And um, that group will be talking about the targets um, and the producer report for that by 2025. The Oregon Coastal Management Program, which has been um, a fantastic leader in this area for Oregon, um, is going to continue to do what they've been doing. Um, they manage um, coastal resources and work with partners to do so. Um, they're continuing to fill the gaps um, and in um, um, habitat data on the coast um, and curate that data and keep it up to date. And of course, um, they're going to continue to work on policy as well. They're um, creating a blue carbon calculator uh, so that restorationists um, can, um, can um, at the parcel level, figure out how much carbon may be sequestered at a given parcel or what um, a restoration plan, um, how a restoration plan could be tweaked to maximize blue carbon potential at a given area. Um, they're also working on, um, at the community level, creating um, resilience action plans, um, asking the community um, the best places to restore um, in order to um, achieve those multi-benefit um, multi-benefits that can be achieved by restoring coastal wetlands. Um, they're busy leveraging federal funding and opportunities with coastal partners. Um, and they're busy, they're going to help create the blue carbon targets that um, the Natural Working Lands um, Interagency Group has to has to produce. So uh, a group that I haven't been able to um, uh, speak about much, um, but is it has been a made most of this possible <laughs> in Oregon was the um, Pacific Northwest Blue Carbon Working Group, who has been working over a decade uh, to, um, to research the carbon science that underpins the, the um, blue carbon inventories. Um, and the Institute for Applied Ecology um, has been working in estuarine um, habitats for a long time. So um, there's a lot to do in Oregon. Um, and this was just a high level overview. Um, and uh, I am I'm finished. I see Adrian's face. So um, I will stop there and thank you. Thank you, Liz. Uh, wonderful presentations from both Oregon and Maryland. And as folks can see, I'm sure things get complicated really fast, um, especially in the blue carbon space. So I mentioned in the chat that our speakers are able to stay on for another 15 minutes or so to answer questions. Um, I did see some in the chat. I invite you to put more in the chat or just raise your hand um, if you would like to voice your question verbally. Um, we did have a question um, from Sylvia Troost in the chat for Maryland. She mentioned, I would love to hear your approach to rolling out the coastal resilience easement program, for example, securing interest from landowners, et cetera. I guess I can I can start and then Dylan can fill in. Oh, Dylan just messaged me that his con computer is glitching, so I'll I guess I'll take it. Um, so yeah, so we're working with our land acquisition and planning group within Maryland DNR, uh, who are the ones running the program, 
but we have developed a a scorecard approach for uh, evaluating prospective easements in terms of their um, capacity to support future wetlands. And that holds in some of that social factors that, that, that Dylan mentioned. It's somewhat similar to some parts of the feasibility study. In terms of landowner outreach, their program has existed for a couple of years now, but they haven't, it's, it's not a standalone program, it's within their larger easement program. And they've been pursuing these coast resilience easements on an opportunistic basis. But um, they are, they've expressed an interest in ramping that up. We've evaluated, uh, we are in the process of evaluating a number of about 24 different uh, land parcels that could, are potential easements for their capacity for coastal resilience easements. So um, as the program grows, we expect to have more of an outreach, but at least as of now, it's really uh, an opportunistic program or approach. Wonderful, thanks, Elliot. Any other questions from the group? Well, I can ask one for Alex. Um, can you talk a bit more about entry points for states in developing their inventories? Is there data available at the federal level to help states do this or states that you know haven't really gotten started um, quite as in depth as Oregon and Maryland have? Yeah, yeah, happy to touch on that. And then maybe if Liz and Ellie want to expand on how their states have done this. Um, so I touched on this a bit earlier about how, you know, data sets for coastal wetlands um, that are available at the federal level for states aren't quite as advanced as other landscapes like forests um, or agricultural lands. So um, the EPA National Greenhouse Gas Inventory does disaggregate uh, coastal wetland data at the state level. This just happened recently within the last two years. Um, and I know they're working on sort of developing more of a rollout plan to states, but that is available for states to use as a starting point. And so states that we've worked in, um, I think Maryland did the same, and I, well, yeah, in Oregon as well, um, they can, states can really use that as their starting point. They can take the EPA data set and then refine it further with either state or regional data if they have it. Um, so that's available. And then, you know, the EPA National Greenhouse Gas Inventory data um, you know, draws on NOAA CCAP data um, as well. So it, it's drawn from, you know, a couple different data sets. Um, yeah, I would say that's really the entry. Yeah, that's that's essentially sort of like the, the, the base layer, I would say, for a lot of um, state inventory development. But Elliot or Liz, if you want to elaborate further on how your states maybe took that data and then refined it further, that could be helpful. And that was our approach, which you just, you described took the EPA analysis. We met directly with the researchers who did it, uh, Sylvester and Lisa Beers and Steve Crooks, and they kind of helped us with uh, ideas on expanding on their, their baseline analysis. Uh, and Oregon did the same, um, but used regional data to refine. So um, um, they have a robust CMEX layer. Um, I always get that wrong. Uh, like, uh, oh, geez, what does that mean? Co Marine Estuary Classification System. Tanya Haddad is on, on the call right now. We can have her pop in with it. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, they have robust um, habitat extent data for estuaries. So they added that to um, refine uh, the information. Thank you all. Um, Alex, if you want to come off mute and ask your question, Alex Sinclair. Yeah, um, I really enjoyed the presentations from everyone today. And I have a general question, and that is what type of remote sensing methodologies are used to collect the data that you are using for analyses? And also, uh, is it in the field, is it satellite remote sensing data? What what data do you use and what sensing methodologies? Thank you. I, I've, I personally cannot answer this question as I think that's definitely state dependent. I don't know if Elliot, you might be best positioned to answer this. 
Uh, I can. Well, sure, I'll speak from Maryland. So <clears throat> for this particular approach, we used the, as Alex described, the NOAA CCAPs, the Coastal Change and Analysis Program data, which <clears throat> is derived from the nationwide national land cover data set um, approach that USGS leads, but it's a bunch of different uh, federal agencies that contribute to this nationwide classification that is based on, I believe, native imagery. Um, so we used that because it was the standard that they're they're using for the national inventory. Um, we do have regional data. We have high resolution land use land cover that includes coastal wetlands, but the way they they do the classification is not consistent with the national approach. Um, so we we didn't we didn't take that. They are working to reconcile their approach, the national approach, um, produce that high res data that could be integrated into the, the national wetlands inventory, um, but that is is yet to come. So, yeah, at least for this, it's it's the national data, Noah. So, I'm gonna take um, the opportunity to put Tanya Haddad from the Oregon Coastal Management Program on the spot, <laughs> um, if if you want to join us, Tanya, because um, this is her this is her bailiwick for sure. Yeah, I, I don't have more to add, Liz. Um, I was just interested to hear you know to hear the whole conversation. Um, and while we do, w while it's true that we we did have um, CMEX data available to us locally, um, it's of varying qualities across the state. And so we have similar problems to what uh, uh, Elliot just mentioned. It's, you know, in some places it's the same as NWI, in some places it's better than NWI. Um, it's been accumulated over time. The main benefit that the CMEX classification gives us is that we can standardize um, data sets through time so that they can be used together, which gives us a more comprehensive look at our systems. It doesn't it doesn't solve the need for having standardized methods, you know, that can uh, allow you to compare locally to regionally to nationally. Thank you. I think that was helpful. Um, could I, I'd like to just ask a quick follow-up. Um, so I've been following the development of methane sat, which looks like it's slated to be launched in 2024. Um, does this group anticipate using data from methane sat? Is the, it's part of the carbon a uh, NASA carbon monitoring system methane set. Do you know if that's a link? Because we're we're linked in with some of those researchers. Um, you know, if it's we would use any data that is produced in a consistent way. Um, so some of these, you know, I'm I'm not super familiar with methane sat. I think I've heard of it, but looking at some of these other satellite uh, or even airplane derived methane measurements they're really useful in identifying hot spots and point you know measurements of methane but it's it's difficult to extrapolate that to yearly data that then would be used for an inventory so at least what we did for our methane rates is look to literature values where they're taking typically in situ measurements of methane um and then, but then it's a small, it's just area wise, it's small, but they have a temporally long record of methane emissions. And then that's easier to extrapolate to your yearly weight rates. But if if that methane sat is something that could be uh, extrapolated to yearly rates, I don't see why we wouldn't use it. And, and can be point located to specific welland areas. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. I'll have to <laughs> I'll look into it more. Yeah, thank thank you, um, and thank you for that information. Yeah, I mean, I joke I joke that you know it'll be targeting cows, individual cows. <laughs>
Thanks for those questions, Alex. And um, I see a question from Andrew in the chat, um, short response from Elliot, but I'll pose it to the group as well. And I think this might be the last question unless there's anything, um, anything jarring, but um, the question was, have Oregon and or Maryland seen green or blue carbon sequestration capacity as a major factor in wetland mitigation banking valuation? Uh, so to my knowledge in Oregon, um, uh, carbon accounting or the consideration of carbon on any level, the valuation of carbon um, in the compensatory mitigation schemes have not has not has not been incorporated uh, yet. Um, but I think everyone's thinking on it. <laughs> I think it makes a lot of sense to do so in the future. Thanks, Liz. Elliot? I was just say it's a neat idea. I mean, <clears throat> I would love to see us prioritizing well and mitigation opportunities on carbon and other co-benefits, but um, we haven't, to my knowledge, we haven't done that so far in Maryland. I mean, interestingly, Oregon's, Oregon's mitigation scheme is based on aquatic function, in, um, it, which is different than some other states, which just do ratios of acreage um, for mitigation. And so if they're already in a kind of a function state, then they could just add carbon as a, as a function to their evaluation, which, which, which could be really interesting. Um, but anyway, it would be, it would be neat. Fantastic. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. A uh, special thank you to all of our speakers and the Coastal Society for bringing us all together. Um, we will be sending out PDFs of the speakers' presentations, so you will be able to see those there and access all of the hyperlinks within the PowerPoint. Um, there's also a link in the chat to fill out a survey um, to provide your feedback on this webinar, and I know the Coastal Society would highly appreciate it if you took a moment to do that survey. Um, and we'll also um, make sure you have contact information for all the speakers. So uh, feel free to reach out on your own to ask more questions if anything um, bubbles up for you later. Uh, thanks so much. I'll hand it to Steve if you have any final last remarks. But, uh, thank you all for joining me today. Thank you, Adrian, and our, our speakers, Alex, Liz, um, Elliot, and Dylan, condensing a lot of information into an hour. Really appreciate it. And for your role in helping to pave the way to make these programs a reality. Um, obviously, a, a lot more work to go, but um, a, a great starting point. Uh, also, thanks to all our participants for those insightful questions and comments uh, as we wrap up this afternoon. Um, again, yep, link is in the